Good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to the meeting on faith, culture and society organized by lay Catholics from Poland and Switzerland, EWTN Poland and Center for Christian Culture of Mary Our Queen. I'm Piotr Bednarski and together with me is our guest, Dr. Gavin Ashenden. Welcome Gavin in, in the studio uh, and Thank my you. Colleagues Zbigniew Przybłowski, who will be the second interviewer, Dr. Łukasz Mirosław, who will be supporting us, uh, and also uh, Łuka Szymon Bartoszko from uh, EWTN. Together with uh, Zbigniew, who will be uh, running this interview, which will last one and a half an hour. Uh, you can post questions uh, uh, in the chat, uh, chat box, and we'll try to pass to our guests uh, at least some of them. I should correct myself, it's, it's Szczepan Bartoszko, not Szymon, sorry. Uh, I would like to also, to I would like to encourage you to support Dr. Gavin Ashenden ministry. You will find information about possible financial contribution from Patronite uh, in the description under the YouTube. I would really encourage you, Gavin is doing excellent job. And as with many converts from Anglican church to Catholic church, it's always a problem because suddenly these people need additional funding because they they lost almost everything moving to Catholic Church in terms of the revenue. But before we start this meeting, I would like also invite you to join me in the prayer because we want this meeting to be blessed by the Holy Spirit, and I would like to propose that we say this prayer, our Father, in, in Latin, which is still a language of Catholic Church. Uh, and I will, just to ease your job, I will uh, say in Latin, which is still a language of Catholic Church. I will, uh, and I will, just to ease your job, I will say uh, in Latin, which is still a language of Catholic Church. I will, uh, and I will just to ease your job. I will. Uh, okay, some technical issues. I will uh, show you the, the 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 prayer in the in the in the on the screen. Just a second. Okay, let me share that with you. Okay, so let's pray. Pater Noster, quies in celis. Sanctificet nomen tuum, adveniet regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitibus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos et malo. Amen. Okay. So thank you for coming for, for, for our prayer. And I would like to say a few words about our speaker, Dr. Gavin Ashenden. As you noted in the email I sent you, Gavin is a former Anglican bishop, lecturer, journalist, husband and father, a Christian apologist and chaplain to the Queen Elizabeth II. And what is very important, convert to Catholic faith. It, it, he was received uh, by Bis, Bishop Davies uh, in 2019. Uh, currently, he's, he runs online ministry on internet, and a number of people is enjoying his uh, daily uh, office and uh, weekly sermons. Uh, he writes also as lay Catholic in various uh, journals, I sent you some of you uh, should re have received the the recent article, very interesting, published uh, on January the fifth. Now let's move to the uh, to the to the interview, and I pass floor to my colleague uh, Zbigniew, who could uh, start our meeting. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Ashenden. Good evening. Uh, yeah. Let me let me start with a question regarding your discernment process. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, how did you decide to become a Catholic from the position where you were, <laughs> uh, which seems to be pretty high up in the Anglican Church? And, and were there any doubts about it should be Catholicism 
whether were there any doubts whether you should choose something else, for instance, an Orthodox Christianity? Yes, the, the, the difficulty is giving you a succinct answer. So you you must you must tell me to stop or wind up or or <clears throat> to condense it if I if I go on too long. Um, I, I grew up in an Anglican cathedral where I was sent to school, and um, uh, during I, I trained to be a lawyer. And that during my university years, <clears throat> I um, I experienced an evangelical re recommitment through a university mission. Uh, when I was in seminary, I was sent by accident, but I think a holy accident, uh, to a Greek Orthodox monastery. So, uh, and these were during the years of the charismatic renewal. So I had uh, a potpourri almost of of, of, uh, of Anglicanism, uh, the residue of Catholicism insofar as it expresses itself through the architecture of of cathedrals and our and our our, our religious memory in England, uh, and then. Pentecostalism and, and finally orthodoxy. So, so these were all elements um, that I was familiar with. And I was very grateful because to, to some extent, one of the things that happens amongst Christians is they become afraid of aspects of spirituality from which they have, which they have no experience. Um, I found myself uh, being asked to, to discern the vocation of the Anglican priesthood. And so um, after I had being at an Orthodox monastery, I, I said, Lord, this is this is high high grade Christianity. I, I like this very much. I I discovered the Jesus prayer. I enjoyed some uh, stretching theological conversations with Orthodox monks. And so the groundwork was made, I think, for me to understand myself more in terms of the United Church before the Great Schism of 1054. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's quite difficult for people who are not Anglicans to explain the Anglican mindset because it's it's unusual. But it has something to do with the hybrid nature of how the Anglican Church emerged in our islands. Um, so if you're an Anglican, uh, half or more of the churches we have were built by the Catholics. Um, many people see the roots of the church beginning in 597. It's almost as if we see ourselves as a kind of second booster rocket to the Catholic project, uh, integrated with it, but um, fired by the new uh, renewal of, of the Reformation, which inspired us, but, but supposedly did not break us entirely from Rome. But this, as many of our listeners will immediately think, is, is a historical fiction. That's not at all what happened. And as you trace the real history of the Anglican Church through the 16th and the 17th centuries, beginning with the, the brutal and appalling suppression of the monasteries by Henry VIII, who was, of course, a Catholic monarch in name, but not in polity, uh, and, and followed by the, the mutual burnings under Queen Elizabeth and the Catholic Queen Mary, though Elizabeth's burnings lasted longer and were more thorough if one's going to make those kind of unpleasant comparisons. And then in the 18th century, uh, Anglicanism was a very dull form of Enlightenment Protestantism with with nothing Catholic about it except for the fact that we had stolen, taken, borrowed, inherited all the cathedrals and all the parish churches. So there's this mindset in, in, amongst Anglicans. When it pleases Anglicans, they call themselves the inheritors of, of one and a half thousand years of Catholicism. And when it displeases it, they call themselves independent, uh, reformed Christians. Mm -hmm. And one needs to understand this form of spiritual and ecclesial schizophrenia uh, if, one, if one's going to understand the journey um, of Anglicans, particularly as they come towards Rome. And, and the reason for trying to explain it in that way is because uh, we, are able, we were able to flatter ourselves that we didn't need to become Catholics because we already were Catholics. We had, we had the best of Catholicism, we flattered ourselves. Uh, and uh, when, the, when the Pope was difficult, we could sidestep him because we had, no, we had no allegiance to him. And when he was inspiring, like John Paul II, we could say, look, there's our Pope, isn't he wonderful? Um, so it, it's with that potted history in mind, it's, it's for that reason that it becomes um, not easy to know as the Holy Spirit slowly clarifies things in your mind when and how you should be received back into the church. But I think there were three factors that, that acted as catalysts. The first was the ordination of women. 
The fact is that, that there have been very little theological understanding about uh, sexuality and gender relations. St. Paul uh, tells us it's important, um, both in terms of the way in which the antagonisms between the genders are healed in Christ, as are the other major antagonisms between those who have power over each other, uh, uh, between men and women, slave and free, Greek and Jew, and so on. But there's, there's very little um, theological understanding about the way in which gender has played a part, for example, in the way in which uh, the, God the Father is described as a father and the earth is often described as a mother. And so the constant tension which we find in the Old Testament between sky father and earth mother, between mm -hmm. the transcendent creator and the fertility religions um, is, is, is in the background theologically for most people. It's not spoken about. So when uh, under the pressure of secular progressive progressiveness, the Church of England decided to ordain women without any reference to the universal church. A good many people then paused and said, can this be the right way forward? Either this is the most dreadful mistake and uh, adding schism to schism, or else it is some very valuable prophetic insight. And because there had been no theological conversation, only political conversation, I mean, you may find that surprising, but in all the, all the debates I ever heard, only politics of, you know, men can become priests, why can't women? Um, equality requires equal treatment. It, the arguments went no further than that in the, uh, in, in the place of the church. And so a number of people then in 1991 said, well, we, we, perhaps we shall do what Gamaliel suggested and let's wait, let's wait and see uh, what the fruit of this is. So, and so began a, so I mean some people saw immediately that this was heresy and problematic and all credit to them for their perspicacity and their spiritual alertness but many of the rest of us took longer to do it mm -hmm. and so there was this slow gradual perception that the politics of feminism were bringing aspects of secular culture into the church causing corrosive perversion to the great tradition that, that began to clarify a bit mm -hmm. by bit. And for myself, two particular catalysts were added to that perception. One was that I found myself in a, going through a very strange period of spiritual uh, antagonism. Uh, oppression, I think, is probably the best mm -hmm. word to use. And as I sought to deal with this very, very strange and unexpected spiritual oppression, one of the people I, I I spoke to was a very good friend of mine who was a Catholic diocesan exorcist. And he said, well, you really, this is, you're not having a nervous breakdown. You're not going mad. This really is the devil and demonic forces. You need Our Lady. And I said, well, I appreciate Our Lady theologically, but I've, but I've always found the rosary difficult to pray. I've not been able to make that step. And uh, it became clear. I, I had no choice. I, I I took the rosary and prayed it. And in praying the rosary, I discovered the most extraordinary healing, uh, rapid and effective in this particular episode, which which caused me a great surprise. And from that point onwards, I then began to look into the Marian apparitions. Again, it may surprise some Catholics listening, but uh, Anglicans have almost no sense of the apparitions. Indeed, I have to say, not all bishops at one point when I was a uh, I, I'd been looking into Garabondal and then from Garabondal, Fatima and Lourdes, of course, uh, and I interviewed a local Catholic bishop in my radio, my BBC radio program. And after we'd finished talking, I said, Father, how wonderful it is to be a Catholic bishop and to be able to take your diocese to Lourdes. What, what a magnificent pilgrimage to make. And he, he looked at me in, 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 uh, with, with great surprise and said, you don't suppose that silly woman actually saw Our Lady, do you? I said, yes, I, I do suppose it. I, I think it's the most, well, he said, no, no, of course not. She was having some form of adolescent psychological aberration, but it's a very good excuse to take our people away on a pilgrimage and we all have a very nice time. And I, I, <laughs> I, was, I was very well, surprised. And, and so I, I began, uh, I, I have, should I, should I, should I say that, um, a few years later, he was discovered to be leading a, 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 a double life in terms of sexual morals and okay, resigned. Well, that's not surprising. Uh, well, I, I, I want to clear 
other bishops from this and, and resigned his episcopate. But, but initially, this was my introduction to the fact that um, a working knowledge of, of the apparitions of Our Lady within the church and a, a reasonable grasp of the tests that the church brings to bear on their authenticity or lack of authenticity is not as widespread as, as I had assumed. So the first was my discovery that Our Lady was real uh, and, and a complete delight in uh, in encountering her work, I, when I when I discovered the, the vision in I think about two hundred and sixty with uh, with Gregory the Wonder Worker, where she and Saint John appear uh, in Turkey just at a really critical moment in his life, um, and then see from two hundred and sixty how she never stops her ministry of encouragement uh, for the body of her son. Uh, I found this deeply moving, and it, and it began to make me want to be as close to Our Lady as possible. Mm -hmm. And and although although some Anglicans uh, professed Catholic spirituality, you could never be sure in Anglican circles that if you if you wanted to pray the rosary or refer to Our Lady, even by her, her great title of the Council of Ephesus as Theotokos, that you wouldn't simply annoy people or, or, or they, they would see it as some form of um, uh, ab aberrational showing off or something. But I mean, it, it was never comfortable or natural or easy or normal to invoke Our Lady in Anglican circles, uh, mostly, with some exceptions. And then uh, a few years later, I discovered the Eucharistic miracles. I was very well aware of Lanciano, but I, I, and I had a book on medieval Eucharistic miracles. Uh, but as you know, there is a there is a, a sort of a rule of theological interpretation which assumes a degree of uh, of exaggeration um, from uh, from commentators and followers of, of the miraculous and you, you you would one could never be sure these things actually happened partly because of the style they were written up and, and then i came across the eucharistic miracle at, at buenos aires uh in 1994 and as i read about this and continue to read about it i i simply couldn't believe it i thought well all these <laughs> all these arguments we've been having about aristotle and aquinas and transubstantiation and what happens in the mass for goodness sake there is simply no question about it. For, for once, for the first time almost, science has come to the aid of the church uh, and given a clear, decisive answer. Hosts bleed, and when you test the blood, it turns out to be the blood of someone close to death and, and with, with white cells from the human heart. And so, and then of course, there are, since 94, there have been five or six Eucharistic miracles uh, in Mexico, Poland, uh, you know better than I. And mm -hmm. I, 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 <laughs> this all began to crystallize to the point where I said, well, really, I have to be at the real mass <laughs> and I can't afford, I can't afford the benefit of any, of any doubt. Um, I have to say one of the things that had caused me to accept an invitation to become a bishop for a traditional Anglican community that was based in America uh, was that they said that their orders came from uh, bishop Duarte Costa. Now he's a very controversial figure. Uh, he was a bishop in Brazil in 1946 and fell out with the Vatican over the uh, the policy of Nazi immigration into South America. Um, uh, and he's a, he's a colorful and curious character, but, but uh, it, it was he who consecrated a number of Episcopalian bishops. Uh, and I was, I think, the third or fourth generation. So I was I, one of the attractions for me would be to receive Catholic Episcopal orders, which um, I believed would 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 heal the questions that had always been there about the authenticity of Anglican priestly orders. So e even with that, it became the, the, the next thing that was a critical, two more critical steps, very briefly, another 60 seconds. Um, the first was that one of my tasks was to try and draw together uh, Orthodox Anglicans who were resistant to the progressive agenda that was being accepted and pushed firstly by the American Anglicans uh, and secondly by, uh, by, by Canterbury. Um, and, but to, to, so there were half a dozen groups. This is a war that had been fought in, with Anglicans and in between Anglicans in the 1980s and 90s in America, we knew what the script would be, and it would involve 
Catholic Anglicans fragmenting and splintering into countless different groups. Uh, and it was clear that if we were going to do this in England, we would have to find a way of uniting the uh, those who wanted to be Orthodox Anglicans. And I very quickly discovered that without any magisterium, such unity was completely politically impossible. I mean, utterly impossible. In the face of egos and different theology and political uh, machinations, um, uh, there simply wasn't any way of, of reintegrating different orthodox groups catholic minded or not back into one church it's like you know when when you drop a vase and it breaks into a thousand pieces um the the, the task of putting all the thousand people's pieces back again is is daunting and almost impossible mm -hmm. and it was just at that moment when i discovered that, that that anglicanism could not be mended that i was asked by bishop davis to join him in his diocese um and, and so all these things came together, I think, I'm certain, under the, under the hand of the Holy Spirit. There is a time, a right time. And um, he, he asked me if I, when I was going to become fully Catholic. And I said, well, certainly before my deathbed. But, but he said, well, he said, how about now? And I said, well, I, I could do it if I had a couple of years to write the book I want to write. He said, no, I mean now, <laughs> said, you know, by next week. <laughs> Uh, and I thought and prayed about it. And I have, I have, no, I have no reason for saying no. So uh, please excuse my explaining these things uh, at length. But it was a slow, incremental journey where the different pieces of um, of, uh, of faith were put together, and finally came to the point where I I could do nothing but joyfully accept an invitation to be reconciled to my mother church. Mm, I think it's a wonderful story, um, and and it seems that. It is Our Lady who uh, led you to the church. Uh, Absolutely. Which in, in, it's, it's, it's a little um, strange because in a lot of cases of Protestants coming back to the Catholic Church, uh, the, the faith in Our Lady is one of the major obstacles that they have to overcome. Yes. Now, in terms of obstacles, I would like to ask you um, about the moment that you joined the Catholic Church. It seems that that the, the ship of the Catholic Church is is, is going through a major <laughs> storm. So, if, if, has it has it been a source of uh, of doubts of sec or second thoughts uh, for yourself? Has this been the the confusion that we are experiencing, um, the 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 lack of uh, clarity that we are sometimes experiencing? Has this been a, a, an obstacle for you to join? No, quite the opposite. Uh, I mean, the one the wonderful thing about having been an Anglican for so many years and made this slow, uh, careful journey theologically and spiritually that investigates the uh, authenticity of the Anglican position and, and, and in doing so has to weigh up um, the virtues of, uh, of secular culture. Uh, one has to ask the question about whether or not um, Christian tradition has 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 been myopic in places, and and uh, and at times, secular culture has acted remedially. There was certainly, you know, it, it was the question had to be asked and, and faced. But having asked it and faced it over forty years, <laughs> the answer had become uh, extremely crystal clear. And so the the only thing that has annoyed me is when people have said, "Ah, oh, becoming a Catholic." And then they use this dreadful phrase, so you think the grass will be greener on the other side of the fence. You, you think it'll be easy with the Catholics. And I said, well, of, of, I have, of course not. I mean, such a thought never occurred to me. Quite, quite clearly, we are in a, a worldwide intellectual and cultural struggle. And, and one of the things we ought to talk about, undoubtedly, is the kind of criteria or mindset that we use to diagnose what's going on and to do this thing properly we need to we need to be able to speak and to examine things sociologically and historically and philosophically and psychologically and we bring all the the, the, the tests of these disciplines to um to the issues we face but 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 also we have to be able uh, to rely on the holy spirit and ask for the gift of spiritual discernment we have to bring some form of pneumatic diagnosis to this and with the moment you bring some pneumatic diagnosis to this what you see is that the church throughout the world in this particular point of world history is suffering from the most serious demonic oppression uh, and so it would be impossible that any part of the church should be exempt from this 
uh, and so not at all. I, I, I knew perfectly well that when I became a Catholic, I would rejoin the, the, the conflict, but perhaps at a slightly earlier stage because it, it would take the Catholics a great deal longer than it took the Anglicans to roll over in the face of this dreadful assault on the faith. And given the promise of Peter, given the weight of the magisterium, given the potential influence of a good Pope uh, and the prayers of the saints, um, it's my belief that this conflict can be resisted. Uh, and one of the things I said, it's not a question of the grass being greener. We have to go and fight where the fight matters most and it matters most in our mother's house. So of course we go there and of course we fight. And so yes, there's no surprise to me at all that we're engaged in a very problematic conflict in the Catholic Church. It's exactly what I expected. Amen. And uh, the last question for me from this sec for this section is, is, do you have a clear idea of what you would like, what position you would like to take in the church? What would be your role? <laughs> how, do you see, how do you see yourself? You were a bishop. In the Anglican Church, uh, and and right now you are joining the Catholic Church from a different position. Do you have um, a a plan of yourself, or do you just resign to Our Lady and and and, and God? Well, both. I think. I, I hope people will forgive me for thinking that my that that, that my uh, half Catholic Episcopal orders remain valid and <clears throat> um, at least valid ontologically, if not clearly clearly not functionally. Um, but the reason I say that is not a matter of pride or of possession, uh, but of responsibility. Um, uh, I, I, I took that Episcopal charge very seriously, and it was because of that. Uh, well, and also because of the, the Holy Spirit appeared to me to be speaking to me and saying two or three years ago, um, take your ministry onto the Internet. This was before COVID, and uh, I, I struggled greatly with the Holy Spirit and said, this will be a very difficult thing to do, and I don't want to do it. Um, but I did so because I had accepted Episcopal responsibility, and therefore there's a degree of, 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 of apostolic accountability too for the faith. And so I do what I do for those reasons. <clears throat> that, that's the ontological motivation. Functionally, uh, if you can make the distinction, perhaps one shouldn't make it, but one has to. Um, that's, a, that's a more complicated question, and and I'm uh, and I won't answer it fully to save people from embarrassment. But but initially, the my, my bishop set me on a course towards a priesthood within the diocese. Uh, and then somehow I discovered <laughs> my papers were lost. They fell behind a filing cabinet for a year and a half. Who, who would have thought such a thing could happen? Um, and uh, I, this, I have to tell you, this annoyed me and depressed me. Um, and and it uh, it emerged as I... Uh, once again, uh, what was happening was I was <laughs> uh, I was praying the divine office and I was complaining to the Lord and saying, Lord, the uh, uh, the translation of the Psalms in the divine office are really not very good. <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, if I'm if you're going to give me another five, 10, 15, 20 years of life, it would be quite tedious to pray the Psalms in these translations. And, um, one very good thing about the Anglican liturgy was that the, there was a very happy conjunction between competent translation and 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 beautiful uh, beautiful linguistics. Mm -hmm. So I said to the Lord, "Could could could we not find a way where I can pray better translation of the Psalms?" And it became obvious to me then that the that the ordinariat had provided exactly such uh, a means uh, in in English, and so I phoned up the ordinariat and said, "Could I?" Could I transfer with my bishop's permission? And it was at that point that they discovered that, that Rome had never received my papers and that they were behind a filing cabinet somewhere. Uh, and so we have begun again. Um, and inevitably that that I, I have to ask myself the question, uh, are these difficulties there to uh, to to, to uh, stop me being ordained? What What are the, in, in common sense, of course it's a matter of vocation, but in common sense terms, what are the issues? Well, one issue is if I stay a layman uh, and things get much worse politically, I will at least have the freedom to say exactly what I think in the public space um, mm -hmm. in, in a respectful in a respectful and humble way. Nonetheless, I, I will be able to do that. Um, and my 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 force will the, the force of my remarks will depend upon my astuteness uh, and upon the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, when one, one doesn't speak with the authority of the church, 
I, I very badly miss celebrating mass. I, I miss it more than I can say. Uh, if, on the other hand, I, I am ordained as a priest in the ordinary act, then uh, I will be able to celebrate mass. I will be able to offer the sacrament of reconciliation, as I have done for quite a long time in my life, and um, uh, be able to speak with the authorities of the church. But I will be constrained. And it's not inconceivable that the political difficulties besetting the Catholic Church that extend some way up the hierarchy may not get better. <laughs> mm. uh, and so um, it's a matter of discernment. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the Lord to make it clear which of those two paths he wants me to embark on. And at the moment, we're, we're in mid-flight, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gavin, if we can move to another section, which is uh, the ecclesiastical arrangements in Catholic Church, how you discover them, and what is the difference between uh, uh, such arrangements in Church of England and, and Roman Catholicism? Can we draw some lessons learned from what has happened in the Church of England for the Catholic Church in terms of ecclesiastical arrangements, synodality, the role of particular groups in the church. Uh, Pietro, do you mean in terms of, of the way in which the Anglican Church has um, adopted a secular agenda? Is, is that, is it, that it the is, focus of the is, question? It is one thing. Uh, we've got, as you know, very lively discussion, at least in some countries, not in every, on synod, on synodality. And there is this idea okay. of having sure. uh, inverted pyramid of, of and abandoning some kind of hierarchical, hierarchical structure uh, because in, in Catholic Church, as you know, we've got a clear hierarchy, the bishops, the, the Pope, in terms of the teaching authority. How you view that from your background? Um, yes, the answer is slightly more complex than, to my mind than you might think that I would give. Um, there are a number of things which the Anglican Church does better than the Catholic Church. Uh, pastoral care is one of them. Um, the engagement of the laity is another. Uh, the the rejuvenation of, uh, of of the Christian laity as part of the body of Christ, their involvement in uh, in evangelistic and pastoral and social projects, that's all done very well by the Anglican Church, and on the whole, done less well by the Catholic Church. Um, but of course, that's not. And and if if synodality meant, how are we going to rekindle the faith of the laity? as the body of Christ, as they exercise a deeper understanding of their spiritual inheritance in charismatic, in, in, in charismatic terms, in the broadest sense, and, and in social terms. That would be a very good thing, and it needs doing, and lessons could be learned from the Anglican Church. But of course, I don't think that that's what synodality is going to mean. I think it, there is a worse version of it, and I, I fear and suspect that that's what is going to be embarked upon. The great, I was a member of the Church of England's General Synod, um, and uh, synods in the Church of England took place at several levels. They took place um, centrally, where 600 people were voted, all the bishops, a number of deans, some academic theologians, and a third of the 600 were laity, elected by their congregations. And you might think this was an ideal combination for the rejuvenation of the church. In fact, it mimicked the very worst aspects of our parliamentary system and the christians all divided into into parties and they fought and bickered and expressed all the worst aspects of party political spirit without what surprised me was without any 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 sense of christian conscience or any christian awareness that in doing so they were settling for the worst possible model of the church i mean not not only to borrow from secular patterns but to do them in the very worst possible way <laughs> the synodality was also expressed uh, in the church at what's called a deanery level so you would have somewhere between groups of parishes 10 20 25 they would come together and and deanery parishes would meet together and i have to say these were the most boring meetings i've ever been to in the whole of my life everybody hated them uh, they they people talk nonsense Nobody knew what they were talking about. There was never any agenda because they had no power. Uh, they were a very, very tedious way of belonging to the church. Uh, and nothing could, be nothing could be imagined more likely to kill 
the or dampen the allegiance of a Christian to the church by going to deanery synods. And then finally, of course, you had parish synods, the parish councils. Uh, I don't think I can make generalizations about those. All everything would depend upon the priests, the nature of the parish, the quality of the, the people, and what they thought they were doing. Uh, I, I, again, if one was to generalize, most people saw them as pretty tedious and really very difficult. And it was never an easy thing to move them from being administrative, bureaucratic standing committees to uh, to places where some level of spiritual perspicacity matched the bureaucratic responsibilities. But if we take these three expressions of synodality in the Church of England, they were dreadful. I mean, they were destructive, barren, spiritually useless, politically dangerous. And, and most problematically, particularly a general synod, uh, the, 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 the upper level, you had people giving their, uh, their, their, their views um, on matters that they were completely unqualified to speak about. Um, even the bishops were not terribly well qualified theologically or spiritually. Uh, and of course, occasionally you had, you had uh, a lay person who really was qualified. And there were moments when people made wonderful speeches. And there were other moments when the Holy Spirit came to the aid of the process, of course. But by and large, 95% of the 5% of the time, I would say these were literally diabolical uh, organizations in which the, the the worst elements of organizational dynamics uh, 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 suffocated the Holy Spirit in the church. And therefore, it is a great surprise indeed to see the Catholic Church engage on a synodal path without any preparatory recognition that it needs to make a distinction between, first of all, these two categories I suggested, one which is the, the enlivening and the rejuvenation and the education uh, and the stimulation of the laity, uh, and the other, the aping of the political process, giving voices to people who know too little about things they're asked to pontificate on. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the one of the problems that we are seeing, or one of the difficulties that we are having with the synodality, is the fear that it may lead to fragmentation of the Catholic Church. We are one church globally, um, not as uh, as uniform as we used to be, uh, but we are thinking that the um, uh, adop adoption of synodality may lead to different kind of theology being taught in different dioceses. Do you have an experience of that sort from, from the Anglican Church? Yes, um, um, absolutely. Um, um, this, this happened um, partly through synodality, but, but partly through other factors as well. I can't, in Anglican terms, I can't blame it only on synodality, but, but you're, you're exactly right. And one of the problems, of course, uh, I think, is that I haven't heard anything said in preparatory terms about the relationship between democracy and apostolic authority. Uh, the, the church has never been a democratic organization. Uh, the, the, the one exception to that, I suppose, is, is when it is operating uh, with an openness to charisms of the Holy Spirit. But, but, but even then, uh, such charisms need to be treated with the utmost caution and with great care, uh, and certainly don't lend themselves to the normal, the kind of processes of synodality that are being talked about. What's being talked about, what appears to be envisioned is a form of, 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 um, uh, of, of democracy, of, of, of subsidiarity, if you're going to use the terms of the, of the European Union. Um, and if you're going to use democratic subsidiarity as a model for the Catholic Church, then you need to explain why and how you're going to build in safeguards against the fragmentation of interest politics and views that you you've just described with some dioceses saying well we prefer to answer these theological questions with a different set of uh, hierarchical values and so we will um and if that means that we are then in tension or opposition or you know that's fine because we have our rights and, and you know this is going to be enormously dangerous and my my fear is this has either been done carelessly or of course been done on purpose um uh, perhaps it doesn't matter which, um, but it, I, I think uh, it should either be resisted or, or subverted. I mean, it does occur to me that th there may be ways of trying to subvert it so that it moves from being the aping of, of 
of third-rate subsidiarity and democracy into an attempt to rejuvenate the laity. But to do that would require the bishops to to, to, to retain um, apostolic oversight and jurisdiction. Uh, and as, as we know, the, we are already at a stage in the life of the church where not all bishops can do that in a way that is in keeping with the tradition of the church. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, what you said is quite important because entering uh, Roman Church, you you agreed to this unifying role of the Pope, who is a supreme pontiff, teacher of the Church, together with other bishops, and this is uh, one of the most distinctive features that we've got. Uh, this phrase "Loma Roma locuta causa finita," the Rome decided, and that's it. While now, uh, if you recall, the ca Cardinal Willem Eick from uh, from Utrecht in Holland, he was he was complaining that when the question of intercommunion came from Germany to Rome, the same question returned to Germany, and there was no one willing to answer uh, doctrinal question. Do you see certain uh, certain risk of having Catholic Church departing from this unifying role of the of the Rome? Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, the role of Pope, into more kind of, uh, I would say, diversified views across the whole globe, uh, with Church in Germany having different views, doctrinal views than Church in Poland and in and in in US and elsewhere. Well, of course, I I am aware of the fault lines of the theological, ecclesial, uh, political, and cultural tensions as they exist at the moment in the Catholic Church. And I would be dishonest to say that, 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 that despite the fact that earlier on, I said, of course, I expected this and was fully prepared to enter into the, the struggle on behalf of apostolic culture and insight. Nonetheless, realistically, I, I can see the damage that is being done between traditional communities and uh, and and the progressive outlook that has becoming more influential within the hierarchy. Um, I think everything will depend upon the extent to which the progressive agenda is implemented and executed. Um, at the moment, it doesn't seem to me that the point of no return has been reached. There are, of course, as you know, only too well, uh, talks about potential schism. Um, and um, there is already, to some extent, uh, uh, a, a deepening of the fissures that opened up after Lefebvre and other traditionalist communities. But it has not yet come to the point where there is no return. So I, I, I will dodge the question slightly, if you don't mind, and say that, that my, my prayer and hope uh, and anxiety and longing is that... <clears throat> Although we're cl clearly in a period of very threatening turbulence, uh, it it hasn't had the worst outcome yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one of the one of the goals, I guess, of um, of, of synodality uh, is is to um, bring back some of the uh, separated brothers into the church. Um, there was a time when it seemed that uh, Anglicanism was uh, becoming closer to Catholicism, um, but then it, it, they, they seem to be uh, drifting apart. Do you think that the synodal path is, is an opportunity in that respect, or is it, uh, is it not? So my answer is no, um, but, but let me explain. And, I, and I, my no is predicated on... Um, if like on, on, on the category of theological inquiry that I bring to the question. Mm -hmm. So most of my life, uh, and I have been elected to a number of ecumenical bodies. I was elected to the Council of Christian Unity for the, the central one for the church. I was a delegate to the World Council of Churches. So I'm, I'm not without some experience of the ecumenical mm -hmm. agenda or the ecumenical culture. But in those areas, the same mistake was made was, was made in the General Synod as the Church of England, and that was these matters were treated as as politically as political events, political dynamics, um, 
negotiations, ar arbitrations. One side gives a little, the other side gives a little. Uh, and, and, you know, the, it's groups that were out of touch with each other are slowly pushed slightly closer together. Um, the whole thing seemed to me to be a, ma a matter of almost a war of theological attrition <laughs> between communities um, trading off uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses between them. And I, sim I don't, and this takes no account at all of, of the pneumatic, the spiritual um, elements in conversion. Uh, I, I, th I think I wanted to, to use the picture in the Gospels where in St. John's Gospel, a man is healed twice by our Lord. So he's blind, our Lord lays hands on him and he sees and he sees badly. He sees men like trees walking around and our Lord then gives him a second healing and, and he sees clearly. Uh, I see in that particular Gospel incident uh, a model for my own conversion. I had an evangelical conversion into Christianity, but I didn't see clearly. I didn't see the Mass. I didn't see Our Lady. I didn't see the saints. Uh, I, I didn't see the apostolic tradition. I didn't see the Sea of Peter. I, I, I was still my, considerably myopic. Now, no amount of ecumenism, no amount of synodality, no amount of ecumenical posturing or negotiation could heal those those pieces that were missing from my understanding of the church uh, and my realization of them was partially miraculous they they these were gifts of illumination that undoubtedly are presence from the holy spirit um that, that's what it is to be a christian <laughs> there is life in the spirit of course, we have to talk politically and sociologically and theologically and, 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 and psychologically, but we have to also to be competent pneumatically. Uh, and the, the spiritual life is a sine qua non. There are things that have, can only happen spiritually. And I, I strongly think, for example, that one of the reasons many Protestants get cross about uh, the role of Our Lady is because, well, if I may speak in shorthand, they're slightly demonized. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the, the responses are so irrational. I mean, and, and why would I say such a thing? Because uh, if, if everything appears to be normal and within normal boundaries, then you don't use that kind of language at all. But the point at which you, you are entitled to start asking that kind of question is when reactions are irrationally exaggerated. So something is going on. Now, it's probably going to be something psychological. That's where we should, or we should start with. But I'm always astonished. At, at the level of rage and vituperation that the very naming of Our Lady makes in some people. And I can't escape the suspicion that uh, there is an element of demonic influence. Uh, and I mean, I, I should say that I think we are all capable <laughs> of experiencing yeah. demonic influence. I'm not suggesting that only Protestants are, by no means. Uh, there, are, there are particular Catholic demons as there are particular Protestant demons. Uh, and we're probably all familiar with them and the difference. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is a long way around. I'm trying to explain why I think that the ecumenical process is inadequate in the, in the, in the sense that you described it, mm -hmm. for producing good Catholics. Uh, to become a Catholic, you have to have a level of healing of the healing of the vision, a healing of theological memory, a healing of historical memory, uh, a, 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 the grace of the Holy Spirit that allows us to, to recognize the reality of the Mass, the reality of Our Lady, the reality of Petrine authority. These are not just matters of common sense and intellectual assent. Mm -hmm. And how much healing does it have to happen in terms of uh, of historical memory. Um, you know, we are we are taught and we are aware of the great martyrs of the Reformation in in, in England. Um, uh, we are aware of the tribulations of John Henry Newman. Um, but are the people in the UK aware of that as well? And in particular, the Anglicans. I I think I think I'd like to say. Again, in so many things that we discuss, there is always vice and virtue. Mm -hmm. And one should look for the vice in a situation and one should look for the virtue. And so in this particular situation, the vice is that historical memory becomes effectively a, a form of ancestor worship. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, I, if I'm a Lutheran, uh, I find myself 
still fighting the battle that Luther fought with Zwingli as if they were still alive today. <laughs> and, and, and so many of the theological and historical arguments take place uh, as, as if it was simply a matter of ancestor worship and continuing the fight as if it were, were present. And of course, uh, and that's common. I mean, that's not, I, I use Lutherans and Zwinglians, but one could equally use Anglicans and, and Roman Catholics or Anglicans and Methodists. And so there's a very real danger that uh, it, as people formed by history, we manage history badly as Christians and we allow it to draw us into this an antagonism on behalf of ancestors we've never met and don't know particularly well. But what is what is the virtue? The virtue, I think, is a sense of responsibility and identification. And so it's certainly true that as I began to discover the price that had been paid by underground Catholic priests uh, under Elizabeth I, uh, their, their, their hanging, drawing and quartering, their, their, their martyrdom for the sake of bringing the, 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 the mass to faithful Catholics, I began to feel a sense of responsibility to them and, and, and a desire to share their burden to some extent, if, as if almost one, one could carry pain across the years, not in a masochistic way, but in a, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that engaged some kind of cosmological solidarity. However, one shouldn't, if, if that is done with the outcome of fidelity and love, then all well and good. It mustn't be done in order to reproduce the antagonisms because that would turn virtue into a vice. So no, I don't think many other, I don't think many people are aware of the, uh, of the mutual persecution. Every so often it crops up in, um, in particular towns with historic pageants where they burn the Pope and or they, they burn effigies. But these are, but again, people have, people don't really know what they're doing. They're just, they're just mm. foolishly copying old traditions um and i mean it's it's certainly true that from a protestant point of view there was a publication called fox's book of martyrs the protestants were far more skillful at alerting their communities to the persecution that mary uh mary tudor imposed upon them and so uh there is a virtue in this the virtue was finding courage to be true to the gospel for the love of Jesus. But the vice was not to be able to see that these are Christians killing Christians and no good could come from the celebration of that. So these, these, are, these are complicated matters. And, but I think, I think in love and prayer, there can be a kind of healing of the memory. Um, but I would want to use a requiem mass as a way of doing that. I don't think you can do it simply by thinking nice thoughts about the past. I think, uh, and, and again, this is one of the reasons for being a Catholic. There was a very interesting book, which I read, I think, about 30 years ago, called Healing the Family Tree by a, a, a Chinese Protestant missionary who was faced with a very serious pastoral disruption amongst his flock as he brought the gospel to them. Uh, and he wrote this wonderful book saying that it was only when he began effectively to pray for the healing and the deliverance of the ancestors in the context of a Eucharistic celebration that that some pastoral and psychological and spiritual progress was made. And of course, what he had done was to discover the Requiem Mass. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I remember reading that book in about 1985. And again, it was one of those small but important um, pieces of perception that would, would ultimately fuel my own journey and in, and in, we have a question from uh, our audience um, that kind of ties to uh, to uh, what is the price that you pay among your anglican friends or <laughs> Catholic? so how do the anglicans treat you now that you have converted to catholicism and is there an openness um to to reconciliation to singing the Requiem Mass and, you know, praying together and letting the past be past. I suppose to give that very important question some thought, there are probably three categories of people. Um, there's a category of people that say, well, we don't care. If, 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 
if that silly Dr. Ashenden wants to add one more eccentricity to the eccentricities he's expressed in his life, let him do it. If this, if this pleases him, who are we to care? So what? Then there's another group who are extremely angry. I mean, really angry. Who, who, um, uh, and uh, somebody pointed out to me the other day. Well, I was listening to a I was listening to a podcast by a couple of American Anglican theologians who said, um, in terms of character assassination, as it just happened, well, we haven't seen such character assassination since Gavin Ashenden became a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's a third group who find themselves spiritually in exactly the same place that I was. And so one of the one of the things I suppose not hasn't taken up all my time by no means, but but uh, certainly taken up a large part of my heart has been several dozen priests who've written to me privately, saying we we, we want we're minded to take the same journey. And here I, I'm at point X on the journey, you know. A L Z somewhere <laughs> um, along it, uh, and and very often, in fact, uh, more often than not, the the problem is with a a spouse who can't take the journey with them. That that seems to happen very frequently. Um, uh, and in fact, I was that spouse because I have to say that uh, my wife decided to become a Catholic several years ago, and I gave her a very hard time. I was really uh, well, again, I, I will use the word demonized. My my reaction towards her, despite the fact that I was theologically and psychologically and spiritually um, profoundly sympathetic, nonetheless, I, there was something extra there that made me behave very badly and unreasonably towards her. Uh, and we both recognized it. I mean, she said, you're being mean and bullying me. Why are you doing this? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I, I am being mean, aren't I? I am enraged. Um, and of course, I justified it. I said, well, you know, this is a marriage. In marriage, we have to go together. In marriage, we are, we are bound to each other as much as we are to the church. In, in marriage, we have to go at the same speed. And, you know, a whole load of things that were not untrue, but, had, but, 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 but hid the fact that I was irrationally antagonistic and, and rationalized. So, and so I now see other people coming to me and saying, you know, guess what? My my spouse is irrationally cross. I say, oh, well, yes, I understand that. <laughs> um, so there is an element of spiritual warfare and spiritual struggle uh, in all of this. So we have these three groups, those who don't care, those who are very angry, and those who are trying to make the same journey um, and um, and are glad for any, any, any help, theologically, pastorally, prayerfully, uh, advice company uh and so on mm -hmm. gavin uh, you publish and you speak a lot about current culture the challenges cancel culture and also in the context of COVID. but uh, first let me touch upon the your reading of the current culture and this this challenges we face as christians what would be the three major risk or I would say dangerous for Catholics in professing their faith these days and what the church can do to help us. I'm talking about lay people, but also about clergymen. Yes, indeed. Um, well, if I can, let me offer a very short and brief introduction about my, my credentials for having any, a view on this at all. Um, uh, and uh, they begin with the fact that in the 1980s, I, I smuggled Bibles and theological books into the Soviet Union and, and into Czechoslovakia. Uh, the, the Bibles into Russia and um, the underground, the, the, the Czech Catholic Church was developing an underground branch because the Czech authorities behind the Iron Curtain had, had forbidden any ordinations. And by they thought, well, in this, by this means we will destroy the Catholic Church in one, in one generation. No priest, no mass, no mass, no church. It's very simple. And so, um, uh, this was circumvented by, by the creation of an underground church with people being trained in secret, ordained in secret, but they had no books, they had no access to, to no books. And so uh, people like me acted as couriers and carried books to the underground seminaries. And this meant that during the 1980s, I spent a certain amount of time behind the Soviet Union. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but it, it gave me a sense of how, of taste, I suppose. Uh, I developed a sense of perception about 
I have to describe it like almost like taste and smell. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just the fact it was a, a totalitarian society that worked in a certain way. There was a feeling to it as well. And the reason that's important is that my second uh, credential, if one can speak like this, is that I worked for 25 years at our most progressive university in this country. Um, uh, it was the homosexual center uh, of, the, of the British Isles and um, the most left-wing and radically activist uh, university in the country. And, um, and so one of the things that happens at a university is you, you get a clearer sense of what's coming. The culture there is usually anywhere between five, 10 or 15 years ahead of ordinary society. And I, in the, I, I started there in the late eighties and I, I began to see what was happening within the university that I was in. And I could see that the, the way in which progressive culture was developing was becoming increasingly threatening to free speech and potentially very threatening to Christians. Uh, and I was surprised. And, and then in about 2002, 2003, I smelt or tasted the Soviet Union. <laughs> and this is extremely difficult to explain. It was a sort of an intuitive, one might call, I don't know, a best intuitive, at worst mystical. Uh, I, it was like a taste of rust in the back of the mouth. And I, I, I stopped and I thought, my goodness, this, this is a Soviet Union. Where has this perception come from? And I'm mad. Uh, have, my, have, my, have my neurons fused? Um, and so I sat down and began to read, and it was at that point that I found the Frankfurt School, and I began to read about the Frankfurt School, uh, and I began to see that one of the things that was happening was that there was a, uh, a form of, of, of neo-utopianism in, in uh, Marxist terms, and people argue about whether you could use Marx for this discussion, because of course he was uh, essentially concerned about economics and the proletariat, but putting that argument to one side. Uh, so it was for these reasons that I found myself alert a bit earlier than many other people to to the culture wars that were coming. And, and indeed, in 2012, I decided I had I would have to resign my post as an academic because I was sure I would get sacked. Otherwise, I was becoming increasingly traditional, increasingly Catholic uh, and increasingly aware of the struggle. And I knew it was one that that I was not able to win. Um, and, and, and so uh, during the time, all the things that I then I, I warned about and talked about and mulled over with friends and in public, they, they've all come to pass um, um, in a much more intense way than uh, I, I, even then I could have guessed. So what, what does this, your, your question then was, um, what can we learn from this as, as the Catholic Church? I think one of the things we have to be very clear about is that we are in a fight to the death. Uh, and by that, I mean that we may very well find ourselves with martyrs again. The, uh, if, if we look at what Marxism 1.0 did in the Russian Revolution and in, in, in China, we know that both politically and spiritually, the first target is the Christian church. Uh, and we know what Stalin did mm -hmm. to the priests and the monks and, and, and the churches. Uh, he killed the four first two and he bulldozed the last and something very similar has happened in China. Though, as we again, we know that extraordinarily there's been a great resurgence, both within in the Catholic Church in China and in the Orthodox Church in Russia. So I think the first thing is we have to say this is a very serious state of affairs. This is not just a matter of the, of a slight change of culture, of, of political correctness. This is not a matter of of um, people being left or right, a, a matter of theological or political preference. This is a fully fledged spiritual assault on the integrity and the very existence of the church in the same way that it was in the first part of the 20th century. And it's only by realizing the seriousness of the position we're in, I think, that, that we can then invest ourselves with the necessary energy and courage to begin to deal with some of the things we talked about at the beginning of this interview, the, the whole issue of sexuality, the whole issue of, of marriage and the family, the issue, the, uh, uh, the issue of, of, of gender and, and personal versus corporate identity, the issues of freedom of speech, the, the capacity of the church to witness freely in the public square, uh, the enormously important issue of abortion and the way in which abortion represents a form of sacrifice to a, 
to a to 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 the devil uh, a blood sacrifice uh, of the most dreadful proportions and uh, i have a great deal of time for those who say that one of the reasons why we find ourselves in an unimaginably problematic place spiritually is because the the millions and millions of abortions of our children have have had a form of cosmologically nefarious effect um, they they have they have somehow strengthened the force of evil so that the inheritance of christendom the glue that holds together personal and corporate sanity which is fed by the sanctity of the saints is melting faster faster than any glacier can melt under under global warming if if that's what's happening so i think that my my, my perception from all this is that we are at a very serious moment indeed in the history of the church and uh, we mustn't mistake the struggle that we have as a matter of idiosyncratic personal preference this is a cosmological struggle we're in and uh, on the scale of the book of the apocalypse or the revelation mm -hmm. you mentioned that um being a part of the university you sort of saw what was coming to the rest of the society in, in the coming years. Do you have this insight right now? Um, can you say, where are we going in Europe and in America? Um, you know, what is going to happen with our culture? Um, where are we heading as a civilization? I guess it, so, so the answer is I, uh, I have seen as far as I can see. <clears throat> I mean, I, I uh, what, what I saw in, 2002 2005 has come to pass but i can't claim to see any further um, mm -hmm. that, uh, if you like i was familiar with the map <laughs> and i'm i'm not i'm not familiar with the map and i won't i don't make any claims but um uh, but um my fear is that the may be a civil war in america it's very hard to imagine how the americans can find a, a, any kind of synthesis between if you like the thesis and the antithesis politically that they're dealing with uh it it looks incapable of synthesis and in which case there may be secession from the right in order to pull up the drawbridge that that, that i mean if you don't pull up the drawbridge the left won't stop <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um and one of the things that we have we should notice in europe is that the, the left will not stop uh right. and they have made inroads into the very upper echelons of all government of all corporations of all education of the police <laughs> there's but there's nowhere the left has not captured it certainly in the uk and i think perhaps in europe and certainly in america uh I don't know what will happen in Europe. I, I, I think the situation is too muddled. Um, I was very alarmed spiritually when I discovered that Giscard d'Estaing had set about removing all references to Christianity from the intended EU constitutional document. Now, in actual fact, they never brought that about, but they intended to bring it about. It was a perfectly clear reflection of the values and the intentions of the European elite as they drove the European Union. And it's very interesting at the moment that, that Poland, I mean, I understand that Poland is not winning this fight. If not, you know, you, you are perched precariously in a win or lose situation at the moment, if I'm right. Uh, and who would have thought that Hungary would have proved to be so uh, energetically uh, defensive for, for Christendom? But, um, I, I i i can't tell what's going to happen in europe but i but i am clear that if there's going to be any hope for europe or for the states it must come from rejuvenated church because as i've said already i don't think this is a political this, this is not primarily a political struggle it's a spiritual struggle it's a struggle against christendom it, it's a struggle against jesus and the apostolic church uh and therefore it can only be won by jesus and the apostolic church and although we must be aware of uh, we must we must carry about us some level of political and sociological and historical sophistication we must be informed we can't there's no point in being informed if we don't match it with a degree of pneumatic 
uh, insight with the gift of, of discernment so so that we know what we're doing and this will require you know what is required of the church well uh witness suffering fidelity courage perhaps martyrdom i mean that you know what is what has always been required of the church when when this ferocious anti-christian force has been directed against it i, I think of the french revolution for example or, or, or 1917 in moscow um uh and and you know other other parts of the world where the where christian missionaries found themselves faced with with an energetic and violent opposition well you know christendom has given way we're, we're back there again in this battle and this uh, upcoming challenge for christians shall we look for allies among uh, evangelicals uh, traditional protestants because so many protestant churches accepted the the secular agenda and uh, who might be our allies uh, and on the other hand you you see church which allows some inroads by lgbt feminism how to how to uh, approach the whole situation pietro you do ask the most difficult questions <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> it has been very interesting hasn't it to see how quickly evangelicals and liberal protestants have given way and and, and uh, and, and the reason for this, I don't mean to be to be rude or supercilious. It's but it's simply without a without a, a long Christian tradition, um, the Bible by itself will not act as a with with sufficient clarity to to defend uh, the church in the position that we're talking about. Of course, the Bible is absolutely essential, but it must be the Bible as it's been interpreted by the by the Catholic mind down the centuries. Uh, well, you, the, the question you really raise is, um, I think, brings brings particularly alert secular fellow travelers, and there are a number of them. There are a number of, of intelligent atheists who who can see with some degree of intellectual rigor and clarity uh, what is happening. Um, uh, and um, uh, there, there, there are several in the UK who write with some vigor about the insanity and injustices that the left is perpetrating on our society but the real question is islam and uh, this has caused me some brain ache <laughs> for some time and again if we if i if i if i go back to the notion of vice and virtue let us use that um let us use that with islam um so what is the vice with Islam? The vice is that there is a profound antithesis, antithetic sentiment towards Christians that has led to the most dreadful persecution of Christians. One of, but as a, just as a footnote, um, the uh, one of one of the tropes of the progressive left was to invite us to look at the convivencia uh, in Spain as a time of happy integrated ecumenical flourishing um, and a very interesting book called the myth of the andalusian paradise was published about five years ago and it begins every chapter with uh, two pages of academic treatises from academics in yale harvard the ivy league oxford cambridge the sorbonne uh, praising the convivencia and then the author then goes to explain how these were these academics were bribed by saudi arabian money to reverse the truth and he then explains the historical truth which was dreadful <laughs> and the only reason i say that is because um we have to have it's one of the reasons why i carried books of theological history into the, into the soviet union in czechoslovakia we have to have the right we have to know the facts about history or people will pull the wool over our eyes so um that islam is growing in power and hegemony uh, and is more immune to the to the progressive secular utopianism that Christianity has proved vulnerable to. But the virtue, uh, the, the virtue is that that within Islam, there are some profoundly pious and well meaning and dedicated monotheistic worshippers um, uh, and uh, who have uh, well, I, mean, I think I think all our listeners probably know that that Islam divides the the Quran divides into two halves, and 
uh, Mecca and Medina, and the, the, the surahs written in Mecca were, were, were generous to the people of the book, and the surahs written in Medina were brutal and ruthless. And so Muslims get to choose which of those surahs they want to apply in their interfaith relations. And when they're cross and angry, they use the violent ones from Medina. And when they're more generous, they use the more irenic ones from Mecca. So the problem with Islam is it's, it is both theological and political. Uh, the point when you want it to be political, it becomes it becomes confrontationally theological. And the point when you want it to be theological, it becomes confrontationally political. Seldom do you, do you find the overlap you need. But I, but, but nonetheless, uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And uh, in terms of alcoholism and pornography and prostitution and abortion, um, Muslims are our friends and our allies. And so uh, we ought to treat them as such. The problem is that we can't rely on a permanent alliance of the people of the book because of the because of the uh, hydra headed nature of what Islam really is. So this is a very problematic question and one I'm struggling with all the time. And do you have an idea of what the the, um, the mode of conduct should be for Christians. Should we follow the, uh, the the way of Benedict and isolate into small groups, or should we go out into the society and try to preach and convert, um, risking martyrdom, especially if uh, some of our Muslim friends are going to uh, to to implement the theory of abrogation, which says that the later suras. Yeah. Cancelling the, the earlier ones. Yes, as they do. <clears throat> well, there are the, there are three responses, aren't there? I mean, what one response is to go on fighting the political war. And and that's where Rod Dreyer, who wrote the Benedict Option that you refer to, Rod and I have had some conversation. <clears throat> and um although people seem to like criticizing him and the book as, as if they gain some prestige from doing so, his main his main thesis in the book is that the political battle is lost and, and permanently lost. Uh, now that's a very hard thing for many people to accept, but he's absolute, in my judgment, he's completely right about that. So then if it's politically completely lost, what do you do? Well, the rest of the book, The Benedict Option says you, you, you keep your head under the radar in order to preserve as much private social autonomy as you can, which I think is just a matter of common sense. Uh, and um, uh, and he refers us back to the original power that that, that converted Europe, which is the creation of, of Christian community and above all celibate monastic communities. Um, so what we don't do is we don't imagine that we can regain the upper ground by arguing in the political square. That's that's way gone. As I was saying earlier on, all the all the major agencies have been captured by the progressive ideology. Um, do we, I, I think probably my, what I say to my children is, um, don't, don't court martyrdom for you have to. <laughs> keep, keep your internet footprint very light. <laughs> don't put things in emails or on social media that anyone can use to uh to to haunt you later on and and don't pick fights unnecessarily uh they will bring the fight to us i mean there will be a moment i think for all of us when when we have to choose at what what level of martyrdom we're going to offer ourselves to our lord um perhaps many people will escape it as as they often did but but uh i i, I think the answer is one one just keeps the faith as much as one can one must keep the mass intact, one must keep the church intact, and it may be that one has to do this underground. Again, when it, when it came to the COVID regulations, I, I, <laughs> I was desperate that the bishops should keep the churches open, or if they were not going to keep them open, then give private permission to, to priests to practice, to offer the sacrifice of the mass privately in the catacombs. Uh, now, maybe they did, and we haven't heard about it, and that's fine, but I was very alarmed the, to the number of bishops who were uh, who were inclined to close the doors of the church. The Anglicans closed the doors immediately and instantly and gave up worship and gave up the Eucharist straight away to, to, their, to their serious shame. The Catholic Church wobbled in this country. It, it, it didn't match up the first time, but by the second time, the bishops had come to a, to a better place and, uh, and they continued. 
but um so i think i think those three things don't uh, don't don't fight don't waste any political energy uh, don't allow yourself to be picked off too early choose the moment of your of your most profound witness uh, Gavin, you are a very careful observer of people who are who might be our allies who also speak up in this particular cultural term, turmoil. I know that you participated in a special meeting in Cambridge University with Jordan Peterson. Tell me, please, how, why is it so difficult for people of such intellect like Jordan Peterson, Peterson to accept Christianity to to join the church you you had some interesting uh, observation on that in your program uh, could you share some of them yes well i've always had a, a, a real affection for jordan peterson ever since he emerged onto the scene because during my university years i mean i, I haven't confessed this to, <laughs> to, to the company but but i became slightly apostate in the sense that um the the the, the main driving ideology was was the echo of Sigmund Freud. Uh, and I had become reasonably well qualified as a psychologist of religion. And it seemed to me that um, uh, that the Carl Gustav Jung could be used, the talking of, of ancestor worship, one could rejuvenate the, the conflict between Freud and Jung on Jung's side in order to disaccommodate Freud's contemporary disciples amongst my academic colleagues. Uh, and that worked very well. It worked so well that I became more of a Jungian, not not more of a Jungian than a Christian, but I, but but my Christianity became enveloped uh, in 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 uh, a great too great a devotion to Jung. Now the reason I say this is because Jordan Peterson is a Jungian, and uh, and one of the great advantages of, of of Jung for us as Christians is that he he validates in the psychological square. Uh, so many of the Christian archetypes and uh, and much of the Christian language, but it's done it's it's done in a way that is parasitic and and gnostic, um, and and I, I I slipped too too I slipped too close to, to original Jungianism, and so it was paradoxical in a way that I found myself woken up by by uh, demonic oppression because it's precisely the issue of jung's shadow and the christian understanding of the more personal nature of evil where where jungianism to call it that and christianity divide and so it was that i just i decided i would discuss that with with jordan peterson uh, and the, the miraculously i was given a the place next to him at lunch and we had an extended conversation and and um we're back to the to the question of the miraculous um you can only become a christian if the holy spirit does a miracle in the same way that our lord said to nicodemus you have to be born from above you have to be born from again you have to have a a piece of, of of holy spirit dynamite go off in your head and your heart to reconfigure the way you look at the world and yourself and this hasn't happened to jordan peterson um the good news is his wife has become or is becoming a Catholic Christian. She experienced a miraculous healing from her cancer. And the people who prayed with her were Catholic ladies who taught her the rosary. And his daughter is becoming born again as an evangelical. And in the last six months has been talking volubly about the miracle of her encounter with God. So the two most important people in Jordan Peterson's life uh, are, are sidling up to him and they will do what I was completely unable to do which is to melt his heart with the love of the Holy Spirit. Though I hope that the conversations we had together might, as conversations before someone comes to Christ, often do act as a kind of salve or a, or a softening of, of, um, of, of the hardened arteries. Um, but the, the, the question you haven't asked, which you might ask now, <laughs> is if, if I am so pessimistic about the struggle that the church is facing, how is it that someone like Jordan Peterson can give lectures on the Bible and fill them with lonely young men longing to feast on the truth of the Bible. How is it possible that Jordan Peterson, as an agnostic psychologist, is able to be the greatest Bible teacher in the world at the moment in terms of the numbers of people he reaches? Well, this is very interesting indeed. And of course, I don't know the answer, 
Um, but but I'm, I'm observing the phenomenon. And what I observe is that when you carry the reality of the Bible to people in a form that they can accept it and recognize it, and in a manner too, uh, people, you know, the Imago Dei kicks in and people lap it up with enormous hunger. And, and we ought to pay real attention to the fact that Jordan Peterson has become our most effective evangelist as a kind of pre-Christian warm-up act uh, and, and ask what it is that he has and what it is that he's doing that the priests and the people of the Christian community have been unable to do. Uh, I think one of the answers is we've been entirely demoralized by German higher criticism and we haven't yet recovered our <laughs> confidence in, um, uh, in, in the authenticity of scripture in a way that, that Peterson Peterson has found psychological confidence in the paradigms of the Bible in a way that I think the church has yet to recover its theological and spiritual confidence in the paradigms of the Bible. But wouldn't you agree that uh, Jordan Peterson is speaking about the Bible to people in a language that is not a religious language? So he's speaking to non-believers in a language that is a non-church, non-believing language. And he's speaking out like a psychologist and that's why he's reaching them. I think it's, I, I wouldn't put it that way. I, I, let, let me try and put it another way, um, which I think maybe, if you don't mind my saying so, but a bit closer to what's happening. Um, what Peterson is doing is that he, he's discovering, we as Catholics know that there are a number of ways of approaching scripture. There are you know, historically four ways we might deal with, with explaining what's happening in the Bible. Uh, and Peterson has found a fifth, which which is a contemporary one, which is I, I think I would describe as as existential authenticity. So he 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 looks at the biblical narrative, starting with Genesis, uh, and without making making any claims to historicity or the supernatural, he simply says, look, this works extremely powerfully to tell us the truth about human nature and the human task, about maturation, about the struggle between different parts of ourself. And so as a therapist, he draws out a level of truth and authenticity within the Bible that only really a psychologist could um, with that level of skill. Um, and, and we live in a, in a culture that is, you know, I mean, there, there are two marks to our present culture. It's highly sexualized and highly, thera highly therapized. And what, what Peterson, Peterson has done is to take advantage quite rightly of the fact we're highly, a highly therapized culture. You know? And, and spoken therapeutically, uh, of, of un, un, unveiled the therapeutic uh, code uh, that leads towards a degree of, of existential authentication, which of course was what Jung was all about, what he called individuation. Um, and so, so Peterson is, 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 is dealing with the Bible in a way that is works because it's it's before the point at which Christians and Jungians have to split. The point at which they split is over over whether Jesus is an archetypical savior. He's an he's a savior who is an archetype, or he's an archetype who really is the savior. That's the point at which we split. Uh, and 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 Peterson keeps back from that <laughs> quite because he knows perfectly well that the moment he crosses that 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 Rubicon he he, he divides his audience. So um, I, I think one of the things that what I've taken from this so far, and, and please forgive me if my if my thinking isn't isn't very refined, I haven't thought about it as much as I as I want to, is that, that he brings a level of commitment and confidence in the existential authority of scripture that first of all we should mimic and borrow from, uh, absolutely, why not? Um, and recognize that, that, that this is probably the language which people can hear most easily in this language of of of, of becoming of, of maturation of self uh, self development um, up to a point of course because uh, after a certain point uh, it falls into the trap of idolatry that jung uh, exemplified which is the the self becomes the god god for jung has a small g and it's the self it's uh, it's the ego um, but short of that the the approach of Jung and Peterson is uh, is is an, an an ally to us. Um, I have one last question, I guess, from my side. Is um, you know when Christianity um, experienced its biggest spread was uh, starting from the Antonine 
plague in the second century when uh, the Christians responded to the deadly disease, smallpox, I think it was, in a way that was very different from everybody else. They did not despair, they did not fear, and they buried the dead and they took care of the, of the ill. Are we and are our churches uh, throughout the world, Christian churches, meeting the challenge of the, of the COVID epidemic? Um, and especially considering the fact that you mentioned that a lot of this might be uh, a spiritual battle. No, of course we're not, uh, and we have we have failed so lamentably. It's really quite depressing. I mean, the very first thing that that the, the church should have done is to say uh, to our citizens and neighbours, uh, "Oh dear, <laughs> uh, death is a reality." Um, the whole of consumerist society has sought to pretend to you that death doesn't take place, but but it does, and we know how to deal with it. We're not afraid of it. And we know what's going to happen the other side. So, so let us try and encourage you and explain why we know, why we're not afraid of it. And, and, and I think that if we had shown the kind of courage that our faith ought to have filled us with, people would have been as surprised as they were in the second century and said, my goodness, either these Christians are mad and completely self-deluding, or else I'd like to be a Christian, um, one or the other. Uh, if it's the first, they're no worse off. And if it's the second, so much is achieved. <laughs> Um, and then I, I mean, of course, they've laid you know, secular society has laid a trap for us by saying that by keeping churches open and by engaging together, uh, uh, we are not loving our neighbour because of the way in which uh, the information about this virus has been presented in the public space, um, where not very much truth has been told. So there is a trap there, and Christians have to be careful. We can't we can't afford to fall into that trap and say, "Well, we just don't care because we're so brave." That, that would that would backfire against us very badly. Although it's been a, a, a real temptation. Um, but but yes, I think that the questions that the COVID virus has posed our society are ones essentially that have been friendly towards us because we have the answers, and we we should have found a way of speaking in the public space and conducting ourselves as the church which would have allowed our neighbors and our friends to look at us and themselves and death and disease with a different perspective and that hasn't happened can it still happen well i yes i, I it, it might it might do um we're hopefully we're some way through the way covid will, will be with us always of course um but the answer to your question is that we were very badly let down by our bishops and by some of our priests. But equally, there have been priests and bishops who have been very brave and, and they've stood out um, and been, been very effective witnesses. Thank you very much. I mean, this was the last question. Uh, we, we already ran out of time. Uh, it's very generous of, on your part, Gavin, to share all these uh, thoughts and observations and your journey spiritual journey this was very very important i think for many of us we probably haven't finished the, our long list of questions but the time limits is, is is reality and i would like to thank you very much for for your joining us the for joining this this meeting for sharing with international audience your your journey spiritual journey your observation of society synodality uh, our culture and thank you for your ministry on online uh, in in your through your website and through your sermons every week. That's is, that's very appreciated. Thank you very much. And and if, hope if I may, that... may add, if I may add, thank you for your wisdom, your experience, and your humility as well. <laughs> well, can I thank you for your friendship? Uh, and can thank I also you thank you, uh, as as a prodigal son who returned to, to a church? Thank thank you for keeping the church alive and well, so that it was there for me to return to. Thank you very much, and hopefully you, you will we'll see each other one day in Poland or in Switzerland. Forward, God willing, I look forward to it very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you Good to night. everyone, okay. all, all our participants. Thanks you. Thanks for your patience. We haven't covered all the questions, but I hope that you will forgive us. So have a good evening. Good night. God bless you. Good night. God bless you. God bless you. Good night.